The next speaker that uh, was referenced earlier by the center director is the historian here at Dryden. It is it's Christian Geltzer, excuse me, yeah. Uh, let me introduce Christian Geltzer. Thank you. More research that we've done here. I'm trying to put context into this here. Um, fly by wire. We took those guys who worked on the lunar landing research vehicle, right? That looked strange vehicle that had the analog computers in it. Um, one of the things you need to understand about that vehicle is that it had, th there were no mechanical parts connecting the pilot who sat in the front with the engine or with any of the thrust systems on the vehicle. It was all electronic. This is 62, hence the analog computers in the back. So anything the pilot did with his hand controllers simply sent signals to the computers, which sent signals to the engine or to the thrusters. This is very first, this is, this is in fact the very first fly-by-wire aircraft on the planet. Those engineers said, well, we can do that with an airplane. So they cast about and came up with something, but they wanted a digital fly-by-wire airplane, and this is the very first digital fly-by-wire airplane we have sitting out front in the parking lot that you'll see. Um, it's an F-8 Crusader. The remarkable thing for those of you, and enough of you are, are cognizant of this sort of stuff to appreciate this, the very first computer they put in this thing, they were looking for a digital computer that was portable with a good mean time between failure rate. And uh, the guy in charge of new technology at the time at NASA headquarters, the, the um, deputy uh, administrator at the time was Neil Armstrong, this is 72. Uh, and they didn't have a good computer candidate. And he said, yeah, I got one, uh, I suggest this one. So he, he gave it to them, he, he said, yeah, try this one. It's the Apollo guidance computer. Hmm. No, I'm not sure. Yeah, it sounded like you knew what I was talking about, right? <laughs> Paula Guidance computer, which is what they put inside the gun bay of this airplane and went to fly. If you don't know anything about the Apollo Guidance computer, you will now. The Apollo Guidance computer has a total memory of 38K, <laughs> of which 36 is read only. And a pilot went to fly, put his life in the hands of a computer with 36K. And came back and didn't eject. And from that, you get, go ahead, the proliferation of, uh, well, okay, um, yeah, we'll skip that picture, skip that picture, we'll just go on. That, that's a helicopter blade, I'll just skip that picture. Uh, more. Actually, that was a super, super critical ring, wasn't it? I, I talked about the super critical ring. Eh, skip the super critical ring. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Um, okay, so here's, here's the disky. Here's the, yeah, I told you a story. I didn't even have a picture to go with it, didn't I? Wow. Okay, this is the um, display and keypad that went with the Apollo guidance computer. And this one, in fact, they burned up the original one. All right, uh, NASA commissioned MIT Draper Labs to make, I think, 38 different Apollo guidance computers, so they had a bunch of extra ones, which is why they could afford to, to, to give Dryden uh, a whole AGC to put in the airplane. Well, they burned up one of the diskies, and they said, yeah, we need another diskie. NASA said, you couldn't have done that. Yeah, but we did. So they said, okay, well, we'll give you another one, but don't screw this one up. And the one that they gave Dryden came from Apollo 15. So what you're looking at in this picture is the Apollo 15 disk. Um, this, incidentally, so you understand the capacity or limited capacity of the Apollo guidance computer is the only way you have to interact with the Apollo guidance computer. Period. This is it. You have to know what your nouns and verbs are in order to make this computer work. If you don't know your nouns and verbs, meaning you don't know what your programs are, you're going nowhere. You have to know what 01 stands for. You have to know what you're calling up so that you can get your program to run. All right. 
So you get the fly-by-wire, you get your airplane to go fly-by-wire, and the first airplane, in fact, to be fly-by-wire, strictly fly-by-wire, is the F-16 down at the lower left-hand corner. But fly-by-wire technology, which has its origins here at Dryden, works its way into the commercial realm with the A321, which is the Airbus. You think, ah, it's just airplanes. It's now in Boeing, virtually every new Boeing airliner, whether it's the, the uh, 777 or the Dreamliner, the uh, 787 are all fly-by-wire now. Business jets are increasingly fly-by-wire. Um, Embraer fly-by-wire. <coughs> the new VW Beetle, totally fly-by-wire. You step on that accelerator, or as they say in Alabama, you mash that accelerator. Ah, it's just a spring under that little accelerator. It just sends a little, uh, makes you feel good makes you feel really good, but it just sends a little current to a chip at the engine. And the engine says, driver wants to go fast. Go fast! That's it. Guaranteed. Nothing else. There's no mechanical link in that accelerator anymore, and it's not just VW. Most cars are like that. If your car has ABS, drive-by-wire. If your car has cruise control and it's not mechanical, drive-by-wire. Drive-by-wire is in your car all over the place. That Harley-Davidson. Back in 2008, Harley-Davidson introduced the top-of-the-line motorcycle with drive-by-wire throttle. <laughs> Forget that cable going to the engine. Just makes you feel good. <laughs> Vroom. Just sends that little signal to the chip by the engine. The rider wants to go fast. Thump, 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 thump. Go fast. No more cable. Drive by wire, fly by wire. Origins here, everywhere. Christian, can we do no. Q and A now? Because we've got other no, no, no. Okay, let's go through the pictures fast. <laughs> Next picture. Next picture. I don't care about that one. 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 That one's nice. <laughs> I don't care about that. Oh, we crash airplanes on purpose. That's the biggest airplane we ever crashed. Keep going. Oh, it was a lovely crash. Sometimes we, formerly called, come on, what was that one originally called? CID. Yeah, but, oh, the what? Something impact demonstration, but unfortunately, one of the senior engineers named it and it stuck. <sighs> Controlled impact demonstration was what it was formally called, but Bob Barron called it the crash in the desert, and I'm afraid that's <laughs> how it stayed. Yeah, next. Oh, it was a disaster. Next. 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 <laughs> next. Next, more next, more next, more next, more next. <laughs> Don't laugh, these are the people that reduced the data that came on the films that I showed you earlier. It wasn't machines. These are the original computers. These are the people that did the hard work that the engineers lusted after. Next. They're hard at work. Next. More hard at work. <laughs> this is what they were doing. <clears throat> That's their data. Hour after hour after silent hour. And the rule was you couldn't go to the bathroom in pairs lest you ended up talking. No joke. Just in case you think all we did was airplanes, the reason the trucks on the road look the way they do is because of research done here at Dryden. And this is what you came to see. No joke, this is Endeavor. This is the last landing of Endeavor out here at Dryden in 2008. Go ahead. As it touches down, 22 some odd thousand tiles and they're prepping it for its return flight to Florida. So they're doing some checking of the gaps between the tiles. 
You can see it has already been lifted off the ground and the MDD and the gear has been folded. Um, this is what it's going to look like on Friday. And this picture taken by Carla Thomas, uh, an extraordinary picture because she was upside down in the F-18 um, when she took this in the desert and had to do this inverted. Um, this picture went into the National Geographic. A remarkable picture. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure there's another one. That's it. Do you have any, pick any questions? Okay. Two questions. I'm just curious, um, at what point did the Army Air, because it was the Army Air Corps, because my grand uncle Lou was actually in the Army Air Corps in Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor, so at what point did the Air Force kind of become its own? 1948. So after what? Truman separated it as, made it a separate entity in 1948 by an executive order. I'll give me a break. <laughs> That's it? It was a pretty good presentation. Awesome. I lie a lot. You guys need to know this. I lie a lot. <laughs> Very convincing. Yeah, well, good. I, at least I can convince you. Anything else? So what is inertial coupling? Oh, inertial coupling. I, <laughs> you, take, you take an airplane, a typical World War II airplane has uh, a fuselage with straight wings, right? Cruciform. And you have the mass is fairly well distributed. Engine in the nose, propeller, and you have long wings. That's the way the airplane is. When you change all of this by going to jets, you change things radically. For one thing, you're going to shrink the wings. The wingspan drops dramatically. The jets are no longer going to be the engines aren't going to be, excuse me, distributed the way it used to be. So you're changing the, di the distribution of mass dramatically. And what happens originally in, in, in that kind of, in a, a World War II type of airplane is that um, when you do something like roll, the airplane is going to roll in a fairly decent, nicely coupled way. What happens in inertial coupling uh, is you narrow the wingspan and often you sweep the wing and you stick those jet engines as close to the center of the airplane as you can and suddenly when you roll the airplane, what happens is the airplane starts to, and you'll have to pretend my arm, my wings are really short, the airplane starts to roll around its this axis and this axis and this axis all at the same time. And it starts to do this. And pretty soon it comes apart. Scott Crossfield did a test, uh, a series of tests in the F-100A to help solve the problem. And in the course of conducting one of the tests, he cracked a vertebrae in his neck, simply in performing one of the tests. Um, when Joe Walker flew the X-3, that narrow winged airplane, um, airplanes are stressed to a G level, a uh, number of, of forces of gravity. And that particular airplane, I think, had uh, a stress level of a G level of six or seven, which is really, 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 really high. Um, aerobatic airplanes are usually stressed to three or four, something like that. When he came back, they checked the airplane and he had in fact stressed that airplane to its maximum G level. Maximum G level. So, uh, he had brought the airplane to its, to its maximum level short of actually destroying the airplane. So inertial coupling destroys airplanes. It just, they go out of control and they can come apart. Yeah, they just kind of wobbles around all three axes until things just come apart and the pilot loses control. Chuck Yeager almost kills himself. Um, 
through inertial coupling in 1953, um, and he's just not, nobody knows what it is, and he suffers from it. He knocks himself out um, in December of 53, and he has no idea what he's done, and nobody else does either. So. Okay. I think we're out of time. Thanks, Christian. Really appreciate it.